Good morning, sisters and brothers. I bring you greetings from the Ninth Street Church of the Brethren in beautiful Roanoke, Virginia. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for your grace that's brought us safe thus far and for your grace that promises to one day lead us home. We pray that you would create in your congregation a fertile ground to receive your word, that we might all not just say, Lord, Lord, to you, but know you and love you with the very fiber of our being. This we ask and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hard words, harsh words. Sisters and brothers, I don't know many people who enjoy hearing these hard words uttered by one whom they love. It can be difficult to hear these kinds of words that many of us begin to question whether the one who utters them loves us or not. After all, why would one who loves us so much hurt our feelings? Why can't they just be nice like everyone else? And while I assume that most of us can acknowledge that there's a fine line between hard words uttered out of love and harsh criticism that is designed to tear down the person to whom it's directed, it can still be difficult to discern which is being offered when we are the ones on the receiving end of those hard words. It's far easier to hear words that compliment us, tell us that we're on the right path, tell us how good we are, than it is to hear words that tell us, turn around, chart a new course for your life. Maybe this difficulty hearing hard words is part of why many preachers, theologians, and confessing Christians have trouble with the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon represents a turn in Matthew's gospel. Before the start of the sermon, Matthew has focused on the development of Jesus' character and the beginnings of his public ministry. The Sermon on the Mount is the first instance when the teacher and miracle worker ascends to the mountaintop and begins to teach the people who have gathered around him. As he starts to deliver his message, Jesus makes it clear that he is going to be something more than a village celebrity dwelling in the Decapolis. His message will have an edge to it that will set him apart from the other scribes and teachers of the law. As he nears the end of his sermon, Jesus turns his, att his attention to the so what of his message as he offers a series of illustrations about the two ways. This concept of there being two ways that one can live his or her life, the way of righteousness that leads to life, and the way of evil which leads to death, is not new in Jewish thought. It goes all the way back to Moses' final speech in the book of Deuteronomy, and is further developed in the wisdom literature. Jesus' illustrations regarding the narrow and wide gates, the false prophets, and the wise and foolish builders are part of this larger teaching tradition. The preacher who is nearing the end of the sermon sets before his hearers two paths, one path that leads to life, the other that leads to death. These admonitions are not for the faint of heart, sisters and brothers. They do not conjure images of an easy life for those who would put the preacher's words into practice. So as we turn our attention to the specific words of Jesus as he sets the path of the two ways before his audience at the mountainside, let us remember those times when we have been called to hear and to utter harsh words of warning and rebuke. One of the harshest teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount comes in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and following. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In this teaching, Jesus is not drawing a line between the believer and the unbeliever. He's not casting a boundary with Christians on one side and Jews, Muslims, atheists, and other non-believers on the other. No, sisters and brothers, 
Jesus is saying that not everyone who comes to sit in our pews on Sunday morning has or will enter the kingdom of heaven. Let me pause to allow us to digest that message. Not everyone who comes to church, who passes through the waters of baptism, who receives the ordinances of the church, who can attest to a legitimate conversion experience, will enter the kingdom of heaven. All I can say is, ouch. I don't need to tell you how hard this teaching is, sisters and brothers, because it's right here in front of you in plain Greek and English. The incarnate Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is laying it on the line right here and right now. And I have to say, this teaching is a bit scary, if not downright terrifying for us, whether we are clergy or laity. If my verbal confession cannot secure me a place in the kingdom of heaven, what will? Now, by this point, I know that there are many in this audience today who are likely raising some objections with this literal reading and application of Matthew 7, 21. On the surface, this teaching of Jesus would seem to contradict many other biblical teachings regarding salvation. Does the Bible not teach that it is impossible for us to earn our way into heaven? Does it not also teach, and I quote, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It would seem like these teachings of Jesus are saying something remarkably different here. But as he continues, Jesus addresses works. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, evildoers. As we look deeper at Jesus' teaching regarding the two ways, we have to confess that it is not confession or works that separate those who will follow the way of life from those who will follow the way of death. Among those who confess with their lips, among those who perform many good works, will be those who will not even enter the kingdom of heaven. Then, sisters and brothers, what matters not is that we make a confession in the proper form or that we perform the right works. Jesus is calling those who would follow after him to know him and to be known by him. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it, we can never appeal simply to our confession or be saved simply on the grounds that we are members of a church which has the right confession. This will not claim us God's favor. The point of Jesus' message here, sisters and brothers, is not about the proper method or form for securing salvation. He is not interested in disciples who would merely follow him it, to gain worldly possessions in this life or to avoid hell in the next life. If we look closely at the context of Jesus' entire sermon here, there's one theme that runs at the heart of Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is not interested in our outward signs, but in the state of our hearts, sisters and brothers. He is not interested in pro forma confessions or obligatory obedience. He is after changed hearts. Put into this context, his teachings about the two ways reflect his understanding that one will not be able to follow after him unless that person orients his or her life to God. From the Beatitudes to the reinterpretation of the law, from the teachings on public versus private piety, these, this theme of changed hearts runs throughout the Sermon of the Mount. 
Jesus' illustrations and warnings about the two ways then, sisters and brothers, in the context of his theme of lives oriented to God, are warnings about trying to put on a show. So where is the grace in this teaching? Is Jesus saying that only a perfect few will enter the kingdom of heaven? By no means, sisters and brothers. If we look but a little deeper, there is grace flowing throughout this passage. For just beyond the surface, just below the depth, there is a grace offered by Jesus for one who will truly allow Christ to orient his or her life to God. Later in Matthew's Gospel, when Peter becomes the first human to confess that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus replies to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. This verse, sisters and brothers, holds the key to understand just how we can enter God's kingdom. When Paul talks about those who believe in their hearts, he understands that to mean that it is the Holy Spirit that prompts those who genuinely believe to make a confession of faith. This means that there is no room in the kingdom of heaven for those who are only interested in fire insurance. Without a heartfelt transformation of our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, I hate to tell you this, sisters and brothers, but it's the truth of the gospel. There is no salvation without transformation. So then, the confession of faith that saves us and the presence of Christ that transforms us both come from the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, he is referring to those who do not know him and have no interest in knowing him through the Holy Spirit. For you see, when the Holy Spirit dwells within us, the grace of God prompts us to respond with obedience. Through Christ living in us, God's desires become our desires as our lives are transformed by the life and teachings, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. The resurrected Christ comes and lives in us. He offers us His grace and His transformation. It is by the transformation that God, this transformation that God recreates us by the saving work of His Son. There is no salvation without transformation. But thanks be to God, sisters and brothers. Because Christ Jesus is not only in the business of saving souls, He is also in the business of transforming lives by His grace. As current and future leaders of the body of Christ, here in this place, here in this country, here in the communities that God has called us to minister to, this is the hope in which we work. This is the hope in which we strive. That the Christ who lives in us will transform us, will transform our lives and our work our communities, and our nation. Sisters and brothers, if we allow Christ Jesus to orient us to God, a response of faithful obedience will naturally flow. Then, and only then, not only will we preach the word, not only will we lead others to a proper confession, not only will we give others proper ordinances through the teachings of Christ our Lord, we will also know Christ and lead others to know him. This is my prayer for each of us this day. That as preachers of the gospel called by Christ, young and old, male and female, black, white, Latino, Asian, whatever race God has created us. That we will allow the Christ who dwells within us to transform our hearts and our lives through the life and work of him who offers not only harsh words, but also sweet words. May the love of Christ dwell within each of us this day, sisters and brothers. 
And may the love of Christ transform our darkness into night. Into light, excuse me. So that we may go out from this place as Christ's servants to bring His love into this world so that all may know the ways of life that come through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. May His kingdom come and His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.